recording. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, Lord, we bless you, and we, we thank you for your, for your great mercy, for your love. Um, we, we need a lot of it. I, some parts of the country are starting to open again, and some people find that risky. Other people find it overdue and exciting. But help us all to know that somewhere um, we'll work this out, and life has risk, and we have to eventually go back out. And so help us to know when and how to do that, and help us to be prudent. And help us also to uh, take care of each other and give each other a lot of room to be patient with each other. Uh, Lord, now as we study this passage today from 1 Timothy, help us then to rejoice at how quickly you had your church up and running. And uh, teach us some um, important things that we learned from these early church documents through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. Now, again, I have you all muted, just, just me talking. Uh, but again, if you have a question, uh, you know you have a little uh unmute button next to your name in the lower left of your I, I recommend by the way if you don't use it i recommend the gallery view not the speaker view but it's up to you but gallery view helps you to see everybody i think most of you know that um and um we but you can always just unmute by un undoing your speaker or raising your hand and i can help unmute you so i think you're familiar with that but i just want to i want to just say uh that's um that's where we uh that's where we are um right now now we're in chapter five of uh of first timothy now a couple of thoughts as we um as we um look into this um uh, letter a lot of people say that it couldn't have been written by paul it must be dated much later and written by somebody under paul's name the church couldn't possibly be this organized um this early on um, Paul, remember, died about uh, 67 um, and uh, AD, and uh, or at least that's that's the main theory. And the church just couldn't possibly be this organized. Look, there's priests, there's there's bishops, priests, there's deacons, there's authority structures. Uh, there's, um, uh, there's we're going to see today. There's an order of widows, kind of an early religious order, you know, of, of women. Um, there are rules uh, about uh, who can be enrolled and. There's all these things set up and running, and how could this possibly be in just literally just less than maybe 30 years since Christ died and rose? Okay, so uh, there are answers to that. Um, first of all, again, the Holy Spirit. But I would argue that a lot of the structures of the early church just simply took from what, what was in Judaism already and, and built on them. So, for example, bishops, priests, and deacons. You know, in the, in the, among the Jewish people, you had priests and Levites. And it's kind of like priest and deacon. The, the Levites kind of assisted the priest in the sacrifices in the temple, just like deacons do today. Likewise, uh, the, 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 the Sanhedrin or the high priest uh, and, and the council of, um, uh, you know, of the, the, sometimes it's called the Sanhedrin or just sometimes called the, the temple leaders, would might be what we would call today the, uh, the bishops. Uh, so they took these structures with them into the new church. So it's not like they were inventing something from scratch. Uh, they took with them traditions they already knew and they had, and they, they simply retooled them, re-understood them, and they applied them and lived them. So that's, I think, one explanation for the rather structured nature of the church almost from the beginning. You'll notice uh, as we read on in Acts of the Apostles, when Paul and Barnabas set out on their missions, they go to each of these churches, they found them, and then they lay hands on presbyters, occasionally on overseers for larger communities, bishops, and uh, they move on. Um, today's reading at Mass was Paul talking to the presbyters, to the priests of the Church of Ephesus, and warning them and, and saying that some among you uh, are not for real. You have agendas, and you're going to mislead God's people after I leave. Woe to you. Shame on you. Um, you, you know what you are? You're savage wolves. So again, he's, re he's rebuking these, but the, there are elders or bishops or priests, there's deacons. We see today there's an order of widows. Um, we, we see all kinds of rules and setups and ways of operating. Uh, we even see a church council by the middle of Acts where the entire, all the elders are called together with Peter and the apostles and decisions are made, letters are sent out that bind the churches to follow. So all of this ex exhibits a great deal of organization which I think is explainable if you simply understand that the church emerged from a Judeo, uh, you know, from a Jewish 
milieu where these types of structures were in place. Okay, remember how we laughed last week when it said even a great number. Oh, this is a this is our course on Acts uh, with the young adults, but it said even a great number of priests was becoming obedient to the Lord. <laughs> It was referring there to the Old Testament priests, you know, the, uh, not, not, not the New Testament. But anyway, <laughs> I, I just love the wording of it. Anyway, so that's a little bit of background because we're going to see here a kind of an early, um, in seminal form, you know, the seed, the, the acorn doesn't look like the oak tree, but everything the oak tree will become is there, right? So we're going to see here a kind of an order of widows that Paul talks about, and he sets some standards and give some warnings about it and how Timothy should oversee this aspect of church life. But it's really kind of a, an antecedent to what we call religious life today, religious orders of women. Um, and yes, their, their full flowering would wait till the, uh, uh, to the uh, after the, uh, maybe the, somewhere in the fourth century, but it's already in, in, in kind of seminal or seed form here. Okay, I think that's enough introduction. Does somebody want to read tonight? Uh, well, I want you to read the first. Um, oh, uh, I, well, actually, no, we'll just take a very short. I'll just do the first short one, but then we'll look at widows. So I'll just read the first two verses, and then I'll ask for a volunteer. So if you feel an anointing, get ready to raise your hand when I ask, okay? But um, uh, we're going to start out with St. Uh, Saint, remember, Paul is writing to Timothy, one bishop to another, but Timothy is a young bishop, okay? So he warns Timothy, because you're young, even though you're a bishop, be careful. And so he says here, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as you would a father. Treat younger men like brothers, older women like mothers, and younger women like sisters in all purity. Okay. So we begin then with this, um, um, uh, this simple, a very how do you as a priest or bishop, Timothy, deal with people of different age groups, okay? So clearly, don't rebuke. That is to say, now to rebuke means to upbraid. It's, it's, it's to correct, but it's to correct in kind of a, a severe manner, you know. Um, and it's something of a, there's something of a punitive quality to rebuking. It's, it's, it's a little bit more than just correcting. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I think you misunderstand. We're on this page, not that page. Well, that's a simple correction, but now come on, get yourself together, pay attention. I told you what page we're on. That's more of a rebuke, okay? So he's saying, don't rebuke an, an older man. Don't, don't, don't correct him like that with that tone. Uh, exhort him like you would a father, okay? Now, when my father was alive, um, when I was a younger man, I tried to debate my father as though he were my equal. And that was wrong. That's to some degree a violation of the fourth commandment. Even if I thought my father was wrong and my father wasn't a perfect man. But you know, we live in a culture today where young people feel very free to just upbraid adults and just talk disrespectfully to them. And this is a grave disorder in our culture. And part of the, well, I don't, I don't mean to sound overly dramatic, but I'm going to just tell you right now that the, the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother, brings with it a blessing so that you may have a long life in the land. Now, the idea here is that to honor your elders, your father, your mother, other elders in your life, a lawful authorities and teachers. Why is this? Because you see, without respect and honor, there can be no teaching. And if there can be no teaching, we can't hand on the faith. We, we can't hand on the wisdom of previous generations. Now, look, Every previous generation had its sins. You go back into 1950, and some people think, well, what a great time that was in America. Well, you talk to an African-American, they might have a different attitude about the 1950s. It wasn't so great. A lot of Jim Crow laws, a lot of serious problems with segregation. But you see, so uh, no era is without its sins and without its virtues. But collectively, as we move along, each generation learns certain things um, and um, hands on, has, has a good things that it can hand on. Maybe it's technology. Maybe it's just a, a way of understanding the world, um, a closeness to nature, you know, you, you, whatever it is. But all generations have something good that we can collectively, you know, the old saying, take what you like and leave the rest. But there are good things from every generation. And as we move along, the goal should be to collect what is good in each generation and as a, as a deposit of wisdom and learn learn from our ancestors, and also learn from their mistakes. 
you know, I, I remember as a young child growing up in a world where ethnic jokes were terrible. We, we, we said the most awful ethnic jokes about people. Uh, it was very common and we wouldn't, that's just not something that we tolerate today. Um, so, but, but on the other hand, there were things that were better in those times where our families were, people got married and stayed married and, you know, there were good things that were going on. So I would say our generation, look at us, we have a keen sense of justice and yet we abort children by the hundreds of millions throughout the world. I mean, we, we, you, you see the vision, right? We, 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 we have, a, I think, a keen sense of, of greater ethnic and racial sensitivity, but we, we, we are, we're much more greedy than, and uh, we, we struggle with uh, uh, secularism. We move God to the peripheries. So again, good, bad, what, 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 what makes a generation? It's, it's gonna be a combination of good and bad traits. All right, now, but the goal is as we move along, we collect the wisdom, and we listen to our ancestors and our, we, 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 you know, there, there's a Chesterton called tradition is the democracy of the dead. The dead get a vote. <laughs> that is to say that the dead have something to teach us. Um, and we don't just say, well, to heck with what they thought, we're going to just do something new. That's foolish. It's misguided. And um, we do, we, we, we do that to our own peril. Okay. Now, therefore, do not rebuke an older man. In other words, just treat him as your equal. Again, just maybe to get back to my original point, too, too many young people today feel like they have a perfect right to just engage in an argument with an older person in the same way they would argue with someone their own age. And this is a mistake, and we tolerate too much of it in our culture. Now, I'll tell you this much. My father would never tolerate us talking back to my mother. I mean, he would take us and read us the right. I don't you ever speak to your mother that way. Don't you know the sacrifices she made for you? She changed your dirty diapers and wiped, wiped your snotty nose and she makes you meals. She cares for you. Don't you ever talk to her? She's your mother. Now repeat after me. I am a child and my mother is an adult. Repeat, you know, and he would, and, she, and she's my wife and don't you disrespect her. Woo! You know, you know, he caught us talking back to our mother. Now, again, you might say, does that sound like overkill? I don't know, but we had, I had no business talking back to my mother. Um, like that. So you see the idea, and we jettison a lot of blessings if we, st if we stop listening to elders who are not perfect, but they've been around the block a few times, and they have something to teach us, okay? So, yes, a question or a comment, surely. No, I was going to read when you get ready, Martina. Okay, well, I'm going to just go on to just finish these first two verses, and oh, okay. you can read verses three and four in just a moment. Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him like you would a father. So, well, I would sometimes have to talk to my dad if I felt like, especially as he got older and his mind began to, I'd have to say, dad, come on, let's, uh, that's not the way, let's go over here and do this, you see. But I would not never just, you know, talk to him in a harsh way. Well, I would say ever. If I did, it was sinful. But I tried to say, dad, let's uh, listen to me. Let's, let's, try, let's think about it this way, see. And so that's, that's the way. Okay, now, uh, treat younger men like brothers. Okay, so he may be in a position of authority, Timothy. But listen, brothers and sisters, pay attention to me. In the Christian tradition, authority is always exercised among equals. Because a person has authority doesn't mean they're better. It just simply means they have that role. But see, but let's go to the top. Pope Francis has authority in the church, but he is no more baptized than you or I. And our, the, source of, the main source of our dignity aren't all these titles and trappings. There, here's your greatest title, the same one I have. Son, daughter of God. That's your greatest title. See, Pontifex Maximus, that's underneath son of, son of, son of God. Uh, they, I assure you, the Lord doesn't call me Monsignor, <laughs> except with irony. He calls me Carlito, <laughs> little Charlie. Okay, so I may be a pastor. I may have some, quote, authority in certain situations to make decisions. But at the end of the day, I'm your brother. I'm no, I, I, that does not give me more dignity than you. Uh, so in, among Christians, authority is always exercised among equals. We do need authority and people have authority, but in the end, always exercise among people of equal dignity. In fact, the one who has authority has it to serve, not to lord it over, okay? So treat younger men like brothers, older women like mothers. Respect them, honor them, listen to them, okay? Um, and then likewise, younger women like sisters in all purity, okay? So again, 
uh, there's a, an exhortation there immediately to purity. Um, lest, now, by the way, we've been through a problem here in the church, as you know, with sexual abuse, and uh, much of it involves, sadly, uh, this, this homosexual abuse of, of priests toward younger men. But I would also say that there are not a few women who have been in sexual relationships with priests. And I want to say this, and this is, I think, um, a very important thing to, that we've come to discover in the Me Too movement, this is outside the church now, but that relationships between two adults are not always equal. So a therapist having a relationship with one of his or her clients, that's not an equal relationship. Or a supervisor at work having a, a, an affair or a relationship with his or her, one of her, his or her subordinates is not an equal relationship. Um, so doctors toward patients. So we've come to an understanding that very often uh, people are, uh, feel either compelled into sexual relationships or they become enamored, but it's not an equal relationship. So here comes the key money quote in terms of the priesthood. If anyone calls a priest father and he goes on to engage in sexual relations with that person, that's spiritual incest. And it should be seen that way. Oh, but it was two consenting adults. No, 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 no. A priest is never in an equal relationship with a parishioner. Well, she's a full grown woman. She can make, no, no, no. Mm -mm. The roles, see, uh, are, not, are not on parity. No, they have equal dignity but the roles are not, see, and so there's too much influence. It's not equal, it is, you know, you know how many people fall in love with their doctor? This is a common thing, uh, the, or fall in love with their therapist, and these things happen to priests too. Uh-uh, uh-uh, no business going there, okay? So again, these are things that uh, Timothy is being exhorted to be careful about here. Treat elders with great respect, treat your brothers as your equals, you know, as your brothers, not just, you're my, you're my uh, parishioners, you're my, uh, diocesan members, I sit over here and I lord it over and I tell you what to do and you should honor me. No, 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 You're, they're your brothers. And likewise with the younger women, treat them as your sisters and with all purity, okay? So these are pretty good exhortations and warnings and admonitions, aren't they? Especially for a young bishop uh, who has um, a role of authority, but must remember, first of all, uh, his, his relationship to the elders in his life, and likewise, uh, you know, to, uh, to the younger people in this life. Now, I want to add, ask you, you know, just say one thing, you know, to my parishioners, especially, you've heard me say this many times, that for you, I'm your pastor, and with you, I'm your brother, and from you, I'm your son. So these are the things, because you've helped to form me into the man I am today. So these are the kinds of things where we need to remember these relationships. Um, and just because a guy has a role of authority doesn't just make him the bee's knees. And he ought, if he's smart, he'll listen to the elders in his life, even if they're not ordained. And he'll learn from their wisdom and listen carefully to them. They have something to teach him. Okay? Even if they're not perfect. And none of us are. All right, maybe surely you could pick up any quick questions about this little section before we go on? Or comments? You know, seeing none, we'll move on uh, to um, uh, this question of uh, a very interesting question of kind of an early form of religious life. So verses 3 through... Um, Oh, gosh, um, three through ten there, uh, Shirley. Okay. <clears throat> Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let these first learn to perform their religious duties to their own family and to make recompense to their parents. For this is pleasing to God. The real widow, who is all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But the one who is self-indulgent is dead while she lives. Command this so that they may be irreproachable. And whoever does not provide for relatives and especially family members has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Mm. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years old 
married only once with a reputation for good works, namely that she has raised children, practiced hospitality, washed the feet of the holy ones, helped those in distress, involved herself in every good work. All right, now um, we'll just stop there for the moment. There's more to be said. But by, by the way, I want you to meet my little girl, Mrs. Jewel. Jewel the kid, say hello to everybody. Jewel. Oh, I know, I know. You're good. Well. <laughs> She's my little calico kidda. Yeah, meow. Say hi. Okay, there you go. Yeah, all right. Good. Now, the idea of enrolled as a widow, you see the idea? In other words, to be enrolled means to be in, 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 a, um, in a, a group, to be in a group. So there was a group in the early church known as the widows. Now, you, you would only think, you know, we'll see later on uh, uh, the, the idea that not all widows were necessarily old. Sometimes a, a, young, a young lady lost her husband. Uh, maybe there was war or a disease. You know, people died um, uh, a great, you know, great deal younger and often suddenly in, in, in earlier times. And so she might be a widow uh, who's still quite young. Um, so you, you see that there's going to be a range of ages involved, and Paul deals with the different ages uh, in different ways. So let's begin to look at each line, but notice again, this is a group in the early church. Um, it's, it's, a, um, um, it's not just sort of um, a, ca uh, a category of people. Um, the idea of being enrolled is is to be um, uh, to be me to become a formal member of a formal group, all right? Not just a, ca a sociological category of people who have lost their spouse. All right. With that in mind, therefore, there are certain things that must be careful. Now, honor widows who are truly widows. Ooh, what do you mean? Uh, if my husband has died, um, that makes me a widow. You know? Okay. But Paul is saying there's more to being a widow than just having lost your husband, okay? It's, it's, so we're already dealing here now with something more than just a univocal meaning of the word. The univocal means a dictionary meaning. We're dealing more with an equivocal meaning, which means that it has certain qualities um, that set it apart. So for example, we call religious sisters, I say, hey, sister, uh, but I'm not using it in the univocal sense of uh, you're my, you and I have the same mother, but rather, I'm using it in, in a more spiritual sense. You're a sister, but not just any sister. You're enrolled in a group that has certain qualities. That you wear a habit, that you live in common community life, that you have a common charism, and that you pray together, and you work in the church. So all of these are ways, when we, when, when, so when I call her sister in that way, uh, or sometimes a superior, I'll call her mother. Um, again, I mean these things not in the strict dictionary sense, but rather in a, in a more qualified sense that has a, a particular contextual meaning. So I hope I'm not being too wordy here. All right. So honor widows who truly are widows. Okay. In other words, honor a religious sister who truly is a religious sister. Some, just because somebody puts on a habit and runs around and says, start calling me sister, doesn't make her a religious sister. Okay. Okay. But if a widow has children and grandchildren, let them first show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. So if a woman is, is a widow, if she has sons and daughters, that, then they're the ones who are first and foremost to take care of her. So we already start to learn one quality about these widows is that they were poor. They had no one else to depend on. And so they turned to the church and lived in community, and in return served the church for the support of the church. But if, if a widow has children of her own or grandchildren, let these be the ones who step up to take care of her. Because again, uh, and we, we'll see here again, if you don't take care of your own household, you know, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. Okay? Charity begins at home, even if it doesn't end there, it does begin there, see? And um, so again, uh, we see that uh, one of the qualities then of these widows is that they were poor. They had no uh, father or son or grandson in their life to sort of support them. And so uh, they really had to depend on the church. But in return, 
they lived in a certain way uh, in the church and served the church, as we'll see. So, um, goes on to say, number five, she who is truly a widow, left all alone, has her hope set on God and continues in supplications and prayers day and night. So, she who is truly a widow, truly a widow, has, is left all alone. So, she died without a son or a grandson or an older brother or father to take care of her. Uh, I'm not, she died. I mean, her husband died and she was truly left alone. Now, sad to say, in the ancient world, there were no real solutions for a woman who didn't have a man in her life. She couldn't make her own trade. She couldn't earn her own money. She was completely dependent on either a father or a husband or a son or someone to take care of her financially. Uh, now, yes, women could do certain, you know, knittings and or home, household work, or they could, uh, you know, engage in making wine and selling things. But at the end of the day, uh, basically the definition uh, poverty in the ancient world was uh, widows and orphans. That, that's not just poor, that's po, po, okay? To use a Southern uh, accent there. Uh, so we see that uh, therefore, uh, those who are truly widows, again, it says here, notice, she, she, is, uh, she is left all alone. And she has now set her hope on God. And then, so she, and, and as we're gonna see here, she depends on the church, but what does she do in return? She continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So she engages in a kind of, like the contemplative nuns do today, uh, just a ministry of prayer. Contemplative nuns usually live behind a cloister. They may have some basic work they do, but fundamentally they spend most of their day praying for the church. And I'm going to tell you right now, if they weren't praying, man, we'd be toast. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, We depend on their prayers uh, to go to the Lord and remind him, you Lord, you said the Lord, the church would be indefectible. We're a mess down here. Help us. I, I give all the credit to the cloistered nuns and monks who've been praying that we didn't destroy each other by nuclear war 50 years ago. Mm. You know, we got all these nukes pointed at each other and we are that stupid. We are that stupid. We would do that if somebody wasn't praying for us. Are you praying with me? Amen. I mean, we, we, we just, we got to realize that if, if, if we don't have these folks praying for us, we're in real trouble. And one day when we die and go to heaven, I pray, we're going to be amazed at the difference that even our own distracted prayers made and that the, the prayers of others for us made, that people were praying for us, and it just made such a difference. And we're going to run up and find people in heaven and take them by the lapels and say, thank you, thank you for praying for me. And they'll run up to us and say, you know, you kept praying that crazy rosary, and I thought you all were crazy. And it kept, you kept saying that dumb prayer that I thought was dumb in those days. Oh, oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Well, one day, your prayers that I call dumb reached this big dummy and, it, and, and the Lord assigned that prayer to me. And I'm here today because you prayed that prayer. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to say it plain that prayer is powerful. And it makes, so these women who are truly poor would then depend on the church and in return would become a community of, of women who prayed especially for the church. Okay. So you see these seminal form of religious life here. Is that where the cloister um, concept came from, Monsignor? For the religious priests yeah, or nuns? There isn't any necessary evidence here that they live literally in an isolated state, uh, but, but clearly they spend a lot of time each day in prayer, uh, communally together, okay? Uh, a cloister means that they're sort of, um, they're set apart, they're behind a gate, um, that they, you really can't, see them. They don't come out of the cloister. You might be able to occasionally go to a little room where they come to a gate and you can greet them, um, but they don't, they don't ever come out of the cloister, go home for the summer vacation. You won't find them out in the store or at the beach. Um, they live entirely an isolated life from the world. So that's a cloistered, but that doesn't necessarily mean what's happening here, okay? Now it goes on to say here, but she who is self-indulgent, in other words, she calls herself a widow, but she's self-indulgent, is dead even while she lives. <laughs> in other words, she's, she's not living the life of a widow, but she's mooching off the church. She's saying, look, I need money, I need food, take care of me. But then she's not really praying. She's living a life of self 
indulgence. She's living off the church, but she's not returning the, the work of prayer and love for the church. And so then she's dead even while she's alive. That could be a reference to mortal sin. She's kind of living a false life. It could just be more of, an, of a turn of a phrase. Okay? All right. Now, it goes on. Oh, yes. Uh, when I used to do ministry to the sick, I was assigned to the nursing home pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I would I'd visit a lot of elderly people. And I said, well, what can I do? And I said, well, uh, you know, Jesus didn't live to an old age and you did. And one of the things that you can do is something that he really wasn't able to do is to pray, uh, just sit there and pray for people. And you can't yeah. pray. And yeah. uh, that gave him a lot of comfort. Sure. Amen. And, you know, I have to tell you another little story that's similar to that, Craig. Um, I won't, I won't name, name the name of the parish because some of you here in the D.C. area, you know, I don't, I, it's not my point to. But there's a, a, a certain parish that uh, I, I went and I gave them a, a kind of a parish mission. And I'm going to say the, probably the youth group in that parish were people in their 60s. Oh, wow. And, and uh, you know, we're talking about an elderly parish. They, they didn't have anybody, you know, they were very, very elderly. And uh, they, were, they, said, they said, well, Father, how can we evangelize? What can we do? And I said, well, here's what I want you to do. I want all of you to commit to praying two hours uh, or, you know, every, every week, uh, not, not all of you every day, but set up Eucharistic adoration for two hours a day in the church. And you send word out to your neighbors, put out a mailing. We are here every day from noon to 2 p.m. or from 1 to 3 p.m. And we're praying for your intentions. Please fill out this card and send it back to us. And we want to we, we re read these cards and we're going to pray for your intentions. So that's your form of evangelization. They were too weak and old to get out and knock on doors or to start a biggie wow, you know, program. But what they could do was pray and then send word to the neighbors. Uh, this is a praying church over here. And we want to know for what shall we pray? And so they sent out a mailing and the cards and the, the cards would begin to come back. And uh, word got out in the neighborhood that uh, you could go and call this parish and just get your petitions that written down and people be there praying for you. And so sometimes that's, that's kind of Craig, what I'm saying. And they felt very consoled by that too, that uh, we, we may not be able to do all the stuff that we could do when we were stronger, but we, we certainly can have a praying spirit in here. And um, so again, yeah. Okay. Now, um, goes on to say here, um, uh, he, he gets back to a point he started and he kind of diverted from it. He says here that um, command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. So again, help these widows to truly live the life to which they've been called. And then once again, he sort of gets back to a point he started, but he interrupted and now he comes back and says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So again, remember, um, a true widow is really alone. And her own family members have either died or and simply can't provide for her. And But if they can and they have it in their means and they don't do it, you go and tell them, by God, you're going to answer to God one day. And if you don't take care of your mother or grandmother, you're going to go to hell. I mean, you know, he says command and teach these things. So, I mean, you know, this is a serious obligation. You know, it's the fourth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. And the first meaning of the fourth commandment isn't just respect. It is to honor your father and mother means that you're going to promise to take care of them in their dotage. So the way life works is, or it worked in those days, especially when there was no social security, your children were your social security. So you, you, you brought your children up, you raised them, you, you changed their diapers, you mashed their food so that when you got old, they would change your diapers and mash your food and, and return to you. They would take care of you in your old age. And there was a real sense of obligation that that's the first meaning of the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Now, respect and everything that goes with it, but at the end of the day, you darn well better take care of them, see? And that's why St. Paul says, if anyone won't do this, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever, okay? In other words, it's very serious, very serious. Okay, now, getting back though to widows, true widows. Let a widow be enrolled if she is, if she is not less than 60 years of age. But father, but father, people never lived to be 60 in that time. They all dropped dead in their 40s. You see, see how we have a kind of a stilted notion that everybody died young. That's not true. Um, the, uh, the, the age ranges were a little compressed, but what really skewed the, the um, 
uh, what's it called, the lifespan, uh, was so many infant deaths. Infants died just more, sometimes as much as 50% of infants died before the first year. I, guys, I don't have any idea why that is. You know, one maybe Ben can tell, tell us, but I, I just tell you, I mean, I know that infants have a lot of complications early in life. Their immune systems aren't all up and running and they, they, they're often under attack. You know, most babies and young children are sick almost all year long. You know, they have a cold, another cold, a fever, an earache, you know, all the stuff that kids get because their immune system is coming online. But I, I would say that, uh, I don't know the reason, but there were huge, huge numbers of infant mortality rates. And that's what really drove the numbers down. But people weren't routinely dying in their 40s and 50s in those periods. Very often, if they were reasonably healthy, they would live into their 60s and 70s. You know, Saint, uh, what is it? The Psalm says, our years are 70 or 80 for those who are strong. Okay. That's from 1000 BC when David wrote that. Okay. So I, I think that you want to, so 60 doesn't mean, my gosh, you just might have no teeth left. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, they didn't always drop dead like, you know, in their 40s and 50s. So abandon those notions, uh, or at least simplistic notions about that. So notice again, let her, let her be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. So 60 years, she should be at least 60, having the, been the wife of one husband, okay? Now we're not talking polygamy here, but we're talking about divorce and remarriage. So we're looking for a life of virtue, just like with the deacons, remember, and the bishops, the same rule applied. We're looking for people who had a stability of life, uh, who made commitments and kept them, uh, who are older, who have no one else to take care of them, uh, and they are uh, quite alone, and uh, they now are fully dependent on the Lord, and they're willing to live a life of prayer. So we see in this quality as these things build. All right, now, verse 10, as you read, Shirley, having a reputation for good works. If she's brought up children and shown hospitality, has she washed the feet of saints, has she cared for the afflicted and devoted herself to every good work. So that's where we ended with Shirley's reading. But again, did she live a life of service and love and virtue? Because she's going to be asked as a widow to continue to do this, certainly in the spiritual way, but maybe she's also going to be asked to take care of the church in, in other ways, to, to tend to the needs of the poor as long as her health allows, uh, maybe to do some knitting and sewing or to do some things, uh, again, um, preparing of, um, uh, you know, things for the poor and taking care uh, of the needs of the church, okay? So, so what are we looking at? A life of service, a life of prayer, a life that's dedicated and stable, okay? This is where uh, we see again the origins of religious life, all right? Now, Shirley, why don't you pick up from there and start reading from verse 11. <clears throat> but exclude younger widows, for when their sensuality estranges them from Christ, they want to marry and will incur condemnation for breaking their first pledge. And furthermore, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but, but gossips and busybodies as well. Okay, well, <laughs> oh, saying what they should not, yeah. Yeah, talking about <laughs> things that ought not to be mentioned. Okay, now this seems like, come on, Paul, you are engaging in stereotypes and, um, and so on. So we, we have to sort of wince a little bit as this is said, huh? This makes us modern. This, this is offensive to modern ears, right? <laughs> uh, offensiva PE or offensiva moderna arium, huh? To offensive to modern ears. Um, we, um, so let's, let's kind of unpack this a little bit, all right? First of all, if she's a younger widow, less than 60, but, you know, let's say significantly less than 60, maybe in her 20s or 30s, you know, her husband has died, she's free to marry. Um, you know, if, if she were to be enrolled as a widow, she might fall in love, a young man might take her fancy, and then she'd have to break her vow and go marry him. You know, not have to, but, I mean, she might be tempted to that. Um, and it might, you know, so in other words, it, this isn't necessarily the thing to do with a younger woman who's a widow to formally enroll her uh, in the, um, in the uh, office or the, um, the ranks of the widows. Um, 
It'd be a little, a little bit like today, a young woman who discerns a vocation to the religious sisters, uh, religious life, needs to certainly first discern that she's called to a celibate or life of a virgin. Um, and until she's clear that that's going to be what she can do, she ought not enter the order. Um, but once she makes this vow, she's expected to keep it, you know, for life. And if a young man comes along and says, Ooh, baby, you got the curves, I've got the angles. And he swoons her off her feet and all that. Well, she's not supposed to do that. And um, it's, uh, uh, you know, again, most women are good and strong and they make these vows in our culture. But to St. Paul, he said it was a bad idea to enroll younger women because um, maybe it would actually be a good option for them to get married. So you're going to see he says that in a minute. Maybe it's better for them uh, to get married. Um, because remember, ultimately, these widows were going to depend on the church for an income, or not saying income, but food and shelter and clothing and so on. And um, we don't want to just increase this role of people who are needy and kind of living off the church. Uh, we want to maybe make sure that they have other ways of support, and we'll see that in a minute. Now, he goes on to say this, that um, some of these widows um, who are too young uh, don't have the, the wisdom um, let's see, it says here, um, they would incur condemnation for abandoning their form of faith. Besides, a lot of them learn to become idlers. Now, uh, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but gossips, busybodies, saying what they should not. Now, let, let's, let's do a first couple things here. Um, is Paul just being unfair and stereotypical? It's possible that this was really an issue in Paul's time, that younger women who were... Um, unmarried, so they didn't have all these duties to their husband and children, um, would, would tend to walk about and engage in gossipy activities and things that weren't all that edifying. So I, I, I just think maybe we should at least give Paul the benefit of the doubt that this was a significant problem, that younger widows tended to um, become, you know, kind of, because again, they didn't, they didn't have a lot of works they could do. They were being supported by family members and they would wander about and kind of gossip. They had a lot of time on their hands. And you know how a lot of us have a lot of time in our hands right now? Hmm? And we noticed that having a lot of time on our hands right now creates a certain kind of, um, for some people and not all, but a listlessness, uh, they're praying less, not more. When you have all the time, you have no time. Our lives become a little disorganized. Maybe we become gossipy. Sadly, some people turn to bad things they shouldn't be looking on the internet. Other people uh, uh, look, you know, just kind of binge, binge watch, you know, 50 episodes of Star Trek or whatever, you know, uh, again, wasteful, stupid, foolish things when we got a lot of time on our hands. So again, we, we don't need to just simply interpret Paul as just be, there he goes, he's a misogynist, he's got a bad attitude toward women. And uh, does he ever say this about men? Well, actually he does. He talks about men who are slackers and, uh, if anyone won't work, he shouldn't eat. And, you know, so he does say these things about men, too. Um, but again, you get the point that if a woman is being cared for by relatives or by the church and she's younger, uh, she's going to tend to maybe wander off and become more of a gossip. Whereas older, more mature women who are enrolled, who can keep these vows, will, will be a better, better uh, candidates for the order of widows. Okay. I think that's about the best I can do. Um, not every woman would do this, but apparently it was enough of an issue that Paul pointed it out. Um, I think if we give him the benefit of the doubt, okay? Um, all right. Now, we want to read on, Shirley, from there? 14. So I would like younger widows to marry, have children, and manage a home so as to give the adversary no pretext for um Mal Malani us well slander just say slander. yeah yeah okay for some have already turned away to follow satan if any woman believer has widowed relatives she must assist them the church is not to be burdened so that it will be able to help those who are truly widows Okay, you know, he, this is like the third time he said that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if a woman has relatives who can care for her, they should do that. And, and again, he's trying to talk about what we call the order of charity. There's an order to charity. The charity begins at home. We have a greater obligation to love, our, to love God 
and ourself and our immediate neighbor, including our family, than maybe some distant, very distant group of people off in a different country. Now, charity begins at home, even if it doesn't end there, but it is important to understand that there's an order of charity and we cannot and must not simply, uh, there's a danger that some people get all involved in activism and they're out there doing great things in the world, but their own kids and their own husband or wife are kind of left behind. And uh, they're doing great work out there, saving the planet, saving the world, whatever. But their own families are bereft of their attention, their, their resources, and, and so on. And this is wrong. The first obligation we have is to our family, uh, our immediate family and friends, those closest to us. That's what we call the order of charity. Okay, there's an order to it. All right, so um, uh, that doesn't mean we don't ever engage in causes remote from us and have concerns for situations like in Minneapolis right now in the news or in distant lands where there's famine or trouble or war. But if, if we spend all our time loving people who, it's, it's sometimes, you know, put it this, this way, sometimes it's easy to love the people in China because you don't have to live with them every day. You can write a check and send off the money or, you know, whatever, I'm just making it up. Whereas it's a lot harder to, to love the person right next to you. I said to my mother once when I was a kid, mom, you love, you, you're, you're kinder to strangers than you are to me. And so my mother looked at me and she said something very wise. She said, well, Charlie, I'm not in the same relationship with them as I am with you. I'm not responsible to that they be raised right or that they have, uh, I am responsible that you, you know God and you know right from wrong and I have obligations and I have to punish you sometimes because I have those obligations to you that I don't have to them. Wow, that was, that was an important insight, you see. Um, family, family relationships have a lot more tension associated with them than sometimes more distant friendships. We, we treat strangers better than we treat our own family members. Now, there could be sin in that. But on the other hand, it could be that that's just the nature of family relationships, that I got to hold you in line, hold you accountable. You're not going to get away with that, see? And we have obligations. So charity, not just material or corporal charity, but spiritual charity, um, teaching, all that stuff begins first at home, and that's the order of charity. Now, notice again, he says here, so to get Paul a little bit off the hook, we got to say that, you know, um, some of these younger women have indeed given way uh, to, uh, to, the, to, the, to Satan and straight after Satan, um, and so on. So basically, his advice is if there's a younger widow, it's probably better for her to seek another husband uh, raise up her kids, uh, finish raising her family, and um, and get to, uh, you know stay you know find another again another husband and stay in that uh, relationship uh, unless she's older and uh, that doesn't make sense right now. Okay, so you see it's a fairly limiting group. He wants to keep this group fairly limited um, because again it has special qualities. It's going to require maturity, strength of commitment. Uh, a life of prayer, and uh, also, again, the church only has limited resources, so we want to make sure that we're supporting women uh, who need it, but we're not, um, we're not uh, just throwing away money uh, after some other women who just use it and run off and gossip. Okay, good. Now, um, now we turn the table and we go to another group called the Presbyteroi. Um, some of your translations say elders, some of them might say presbyters, very few, like Douay Reims, I think, says priest. Anyone got the Douay Reims right now in front of them? Okay, not, no one. Okay, but I'm pretty sure the Douay Reims just renders it priest. Now, the Greek word is presbyteroi. Now, presbyteroi means literally elder, but again, remember, it is meant in the univocal dictionary sense. An elder who's someone who's 55 or older, or six year old, or whatever, whatever date we set, whoever is this age and older is an elder. That's the univocal dictionary sense. But in the early church, a presbyter was, was an elder, was not just someone who was chronologically older, necessarily, but rather who had an office that was called the office of elder or presbyteros. Now, maybe you can sort of see how in the English, priest is just a mispronunciation of presbyter. So it comes down through, uh, through from, the, from the Greek, through the German, and the, it gets twisted around on the French. And so you go presbyteroi, priest. 
okay? So you're, you know, a little, little, little priest, you know? Uh, so uh, you see the relationship in English between the word presbyter or presbyteroi in the plural and the word priest, okay? So for us, we want to see that this is not simply people who are such and so age and older, but rather this is an office in the church, okay? So With that in mind, um, okay, someone say something or a question? Uh, so does that, um, do they get that from the elder of the church, like in Baptist churches, they say the elder of the church? Yeah, although I don't know in Baptist churches if that if that means just somebody who's older or if it really is a, a chief officer of the church. Most of the time it is, yeah. Okay, yeah. And you'll see here that it's very clear that these elders rule, okay? They have a, an office of uh, oversight or of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, of uh, authority, okay? So, yeah. um, but I just want to make it clear uh, that the word presbyter doesn't just, in the, in, the, in the New Testament Greek sense, as it's used contextually, doesn't always mean a man who's 60 or older or, or all men who are 60 and older. There's an office that's uh, mentioned here. So let's read with that. Um, would someone like to read verse 17 uh, until I tell you to stop? <laughs> Maybe one of the men, because this is about presbyters. All right, Craig, I just see you raise your hand. Okay, you unmute and go ahead and read 17 and following. Presbyters who preside well deserve double honor, especially those who toil in preaching and teaching. But the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it is threshing and a worker deserves his pay. Do not accept an accusation against a presbyter unless it is supported by two or three witnesses. Reprimand publicly those who do sin so that the rest will also will be afraid. I charge you before God and Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these rules without prejudice, doing nothing out of favoritism. Do okay, not now, lay hand- Let's just stop there for a minute so we can get some of this. Um, so let the priest or the presbyters, the elders, whatever your translation says, who rule well. Uh, you, what did your translation say, Craig? It said who? Who deserve double honor. Uh, let the elders who, uh, or the presbyters who. Preside well. Preside well. Okay. Yeah, that, I'm reading the NAB. Let me check the Greek text here. Um, it's uh, interesting. Oops, wait a minute. Sorry. 1 Timothy 15, verse 7. That's verse 17, right? Yes. Yeah, elders who lead. Now the Greek text says, "Oi kalos prostatores." Uh, yeah, um, it, it, it's a prostatores. Uh, if you really rule is the better word here. Uh, it doesn't. You know, the word preside. I think is weak in English. Uh, Sometimes to preside just means you're sort of sitting there in a chair. You know, the priest presides at mass. I mean, I get that, but um, there's more of a, uh, the sense here is uh, pro, to mean it's going to, to stand before, or um, um, to rule over, to give attention to. Uh, Prostamini is the Greek root word, and it means to, most literally, to exhibit a leadership of rule, um, uh, to di- uh, of one who directs. Uh, so that would be more the Greek sense, okay? So I think rule is the better word than just simply preside, which is not wrong, but I think in English, it's not strong enough, okay? The, uh, the RSV has the word rule there instead. Yeah, okay. Do you, do you have a preference between the NAB and the RSV? Well, between the two of them, I'd say the RSV, but I, I would actually even go with the, uh, the English Standard Version too. Those are all okay. good options to the NAV, which is familiar to us, but it's um, not always as accurate. Okay. That the rulers and that the uh, presbyters who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially, pay attention now, those who labor in preaching and teaching. <laughs> especially the motor mouths. <laughs> okay. Now, I will say that yeah, right now, you know, in, in, in the modern church, we've sort of seen uh, a bit of a, a transposition, or not a... Um, We've seen a bit of a movement in the priesthood. If you were to get into the, if you were to go back to the 1950s and 40s and before, 
there was a kind of um, a sacramental functionality that priests adopted. They were basically there to provide sacraments and preaching was sort of curtailed. There was very little of it. The sermons on Sunday were short. Most weekday masses, there was no sermon at all. Um, uh, mostly religious sisters and others took care of the teaching. You wouldn't have priests doing extended teachings and so on in parishes. But in, in more recent times, we've sort of moved, um, even in the liturgy, where the priest spends more, spends more extended time in the preaching, where he's expected to preach certainly at every Sunday Mass, and more often than not, he's expected to give some sort of sermon at even a daily Mass, unless it's a real quick commuter Mass. Uh, and likewise, we are expected to learn to be good teachers, like I'm doing now, trying to work with you and teach extensively. Um, so that we're less sacramentally, simply sacramental functionaries. We really are, as, as the old threefold office, that we, that we, uh, that we, um, we, we teach, govern, and sanctify. Hmm? Uh, where we have a role of teaching the community, of sanctifying through the celebration of the sacraments, and governing. Okay? Uh, so this role has been elevated. Now, some in the traditional movement feel that too much time is spent in the liturgy of the word, and that the real goal is to get to the Eucharistic prayer and that priests should preach less. And I just simply don't agree. Uh, and I, have, I would go to texts like this to say so. Um, but I think what they're upset about is, you know, they still don't like the new mass. <laughs> and I don't mean, I don't want to reduce their, their concerns, but I, it is true that mass is not first and foremost um, for us, a place for us to go and learn. It is first and foremost an act of worship toward God. And I think that something of an overreaction sets up among some who say, therefore, all these long homilies and this teaching stuff should be shortened and we should turn quickly to the altar and spend most of our time focused on God and worshiping God. And I would look rather more for a balance, balance. Uh, we may not have the balance right today. There's a certain uh, expression, there's an elephantitis of the word. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's your medical term there, Dr. Benjamin, elephantitis, but it grows cancerously large and the Eucharistic prayer is like five minutes. <laughs> you know, the priest goes on and on preaching and then short Eucharistic prayer, boom, Eucharist, you know, and we're out of here. Uh, so there is maybe a lack of balance um, that we can recover, but I wouldn't want to go back to the days where priests did little or no uh, instruction, or if they did, it wasn't rooted deeply in the Word of God. Uh, it was just maybe a moral exhortation, and we're done here. And, uh, so again, uh, there is here, therefore, an exhortation that elders, priests who rule well, should be considered worthy of double honor, especially for those who labor in teaching. Now, is there a question? I'm hearing a... Yeah, I had a question, you know, because you talk about that, but some of the... Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what time frame you're talking about from preaching, because some of the famous saints or whatever were great preachers and gave very long homilies and so forth. So are you talking about just recently or? Yeah, I, I would say largely um, that those who are more of the traditional movement kind of have a time frame in mind of the, the mass as it was from about 1900 to 1965. Uh, um, but you, you're right, uh, Ken, um, if you look at the sermons of uh, John Vianney, or you look at the sermons of a Cardinal Gibbons in Baltimore, he was known to sometimes preach for two hours on a Sunday. Now, remember, they didn't have much else to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, it wasn't like, they, come on, man, I got to get home and watch the game. You know, in 1910, there was no game. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so again, longer sermons and things were more the norm. And um, so, again, I don't want to pick on the traditional movement. I have great respect for them. They're trying to get us back to something that we might have out of balance. On the other hand, I think that maybe they've tipped the balance a little bit too much in the other direction of short, simple exhortations. And I just think, especially today, where there's such stinking thinking in the world, that we've got to spend extended time in the Mass really breaking open the Word of God and teaching its core principles and really helping people to lay hold of them, okay? Yeah, yeah, surely, yeah. I also think uh, the balance on the uh, teaching and the um, uh, getting to the sacraments, if you're, <clears throat> if you're reading scripture and you're teaching on it, 
in a way that it's enriching, it should make you more, you know, more, you know, you, you're more in a, a different state of, of spirit to receive the sacraments because you've heard a word and you truly, you know, you've opened yourself up to hear what God is saying to you so that when you receive him, it's like a, you know, I the icing on the cake. Yeah, exactly. And again, I, I couldn't agree with you more. There should always be some link to the Eucharistic Lord in the sermon too. By the way, I think another reason that there's a resistance to longer sermons and so on uh, in the, uh, among traditional Catholics is that they see it as a rather an imitation of the Protestants. And remember, the Protestants have long sermons and basically their Sunday morning services are kind of glorified Bible studies. Uh, but they and they generally don't have a communion service, maybe once a month or so. But, but again, I I, I just think that I'm, I'm looking for a balance. That's all I'll say. Okay, Gloria, can you unmute or I can help you? I'm I'm a convert, and so for me, um, the the beauty of the mass, you know, just stands on its own. But I I really like to have a good homily and I don't worry about the time. I worry about how it connects to what God said in the gospel and how that relates to me in my life. And, and so I think that that's the point uh, uh, of all of this. If somebody's getting up there to read uh, the homilies that, what do you call them that just come out of the book or whatever? Yeah. And something like that's pointless to me yeah. because that's not that from someone's heart <laughs> who really has studied what God meant at that time because as we're sitting here doing this bible study i don't know about all of you but every time i hear a scripture and i i'm in a different place it has a different meaning mm -hmm. and i feel that it's the same for those of you that teach us as you're putting it together you're studying and preparing for that homily i'm sure something different god has shared with you and it's for us it's not for you just alone and so um yeah i find it <laughs> It's yeah. not a Protestant thing. It's it's yeah. it's more Catholic than people think because I think that connects it all for me. Yeah, that, that's a convert. <laughs> exactly. Then, getting back to what you said, Craig, earlier, you know, if you look at the fathers of the church, you know, they they did extensive teachings both in the mass but also outside of the mass. So again, this idea of the priest of the '40s and the '50s who was largely a sacramental functionary and didn't do a lot of teaching but sort of consigned that to the religious sisters and gave short sermons um, is, is something of an anomaly. Now, uh, I see that, uh, is it Mrs. Mackey, uh, is it? Uh, yeah, Beverly. Beverly, yeah. Thank you. Th thank you, Gloria, You've spoken well. Um, I wanted to just add to that, that the Catholic Church, you're talking about tradition, do an excellent job on teaching the children. Mm. Yeah. But what happens once you, while you're an adult? And that if you don't get that teaching during the homily, mm -hmm. when are you going to get it? Yeah. And so that when life comes and throws you a curve, you fall apart because you weren't taught on how to apply the word to your life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right, uh, Beverly. That's a very good, one of the critiques of the church, of the, the immigrant church, from about 1890 to about 1950 was that we, we, we devoted ourselves almost wholly to the education of children and the running of Catholic schools. Almost the entire life of the parish revolved around the education of children and running parochial schools. And we didn't want them to be exposed to Protestant government sponsored Protestant schools. So we ran our own schools. But the danger there was that we never taught adults. So we specialized in teaching children Baltimore catechisms and all of those things, which were beautiful tools for children, but we never really brought the adults along. So in my own parishes, and my DRE is right here with us, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I would say, surely, you know, we do whole family catechesis. That's the goal. So when the kids are up in the classrooms, I'm teaching the same material to the parents down in the cafeteria. And we're very committed to that, uh, that we have, we have vigorous opportunities for adult education. These Bible studies, we also open our RCIA classes to anyone who wants to come. We also have every Sunday morning adult catechesis. And I expect those parents to come who have children in the program, but we also 
have a lot of them who don't have children in the program, but they just come to learn. So mm -hmm. again, I couldn't agree with you more. And one of the dangers that we, we've not helped people to come to an adult faith, although it was a beautiful thing we created, that Catholic school system was a magnificent, uh, admirable and glorious thing. We also neglected other things uh, to keep it up and running. Right. And, and Beverly, I think the church is realizing that it's the parents that need to be catechized first. And us being home these last couple of months, where we say the domestic church just starts at home. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, there is a push nationwide for the parents to be catechized. And I, I think that's what we've lost. That's why we don't have a lot of our kids going to church because they weren't catechized. Mm -hmm. All right, I think enough said. Let's, uh, we, got a, uh, we got about 15 more minutes, uh, and I think we can finish the chapter by then, but let's see how far we get. Um, notice it goes on to say here, that he, he has a very interesting um, little thing that he quotes here, um, but it, uh, I don't see any footnote to where this actually is in the Bible, but it says here, where the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox, I'm sure it's from Leviticus, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Now, the idea here is that uh, you, you would have this, um, you throw all this grain, um, and one way you broke away, broke open the grain from the shell is you'd have an ox tread over this, this big pile of grain, and it would be attached to a circle, you know, kind of a wagon wheel, and it would be allowed to eat some of it as it, as it would travel along. So, you shouldn't put a muzzle so that they can't eat the grain that is treading out, okay? Now that might sound gross, but remember this grain is gonna be taken and baked and you know cooked and stuff. So, you know, don't worry too much about that. It's like saying, okay. Now, it goes on to say, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and also the laborer deserves his wages. Now therefore, again, I think that <clears throat> every priest <coughs> should graciously be willing to preach for free. On the other hand, though, for the people of God, there is something, there, there's something about money that we tend to value what we pay for. So if we have a free event here at the parish, I guarantee you the attendance is going to be mediocre. But if you, if you even get people to put $5 down for a ticket, <laughs> they're going to be, they're going to, they, they, they have some skin in the game now and they're going to have buy-in. So there's something of a, of a word to the people of God here is that, look, even if your priest is willing to do it for free, you ought to be willing to be generous, not to him personally necessarily, but to the church. Now, there, therefore, again, a lot of us will, like EWTN had this fund drives, fundraising drives, EWTN radio and TV and other things. And you be careful not to just, you know, park on somebody else's dime. You know, we all should contribute when we receive teaching and we receive uh, things from the church, we ought to therefore in turn be generous because, and giving money is a way that we express that I find value in this. Now, if I you should just do it for free, sort of suggest, okay, maybe I should, but how much do you value the word of God and the teaching that comes to you, you see? So I think there's, that we're trying to find a middle ground here where the priest isn't out for the money, most of us don't make much money, okay? I, they give me 30000 a year here at the parish, but they give me a beautiful home to live in and they take care, good care of me. And, and by the way, that $30,000 is mostly disposable income, you know? But it's not a lot of money, I and mean, that's not the point. I, I go out and I give talks, and usually they pay me when I go, but I would, I would go even if they didn't pay me. But I think it's important, though, uh, that people do offer up some kind of an honorarium or a, or a, a thing, not just to me, but, but just to whoever gives you, a Scott Hahn or a, a, any lay person, someone who teaches that they, the laborer deserves the wage. Uh, why? Because we're saying, I value what you do. And that's how we express value, okay, with money. Um, and so that's a, a way of just engaging the faithful in a kind of a, a sense of, worth, a sense of the worth and the dignity. Uh, and uh, we know that if we, a lot of times, for example, EWTN radio engaged me. And I said, you know, I figured, man, they're always running on a shoestring budget. But they said, 
So you're, I said, I, I said, I'll be doing this for free. And they said, no, 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 we want to pay you. And I said, well, no, I'm happy to do it for free. No, Father, listen, we want to pay you because we also want to make sure that you're committed <laughs> and that you show up every time on time prepared for your radio show. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and you're right. If I do something for free gratis, I'm going to be a little less engaged and I'll take more liberties. So it just, maybe it shouldn't be that way, but I'm just saying, this is how we are as human beings. And so Paul's just speaking here, telling us, you know, at, at both ends of the equation, it keeps both the, the, the minister, the preacher, the priest, the Scott Hahn, the lay evangelist, whoever they are on their game, uh, because they can make it their livelihood and they can spend time in this word but they, uh, you know, not be distracted by having to also go and be a firefighter during the week and or uh, go over here and uh, be a, a nurse or a doctor. Um, uh, they're, they're wholly committed. They're, they're, they're able to take an income. The people of God support them in this work. And um, they are now wholly committed to it. And they're expected to be on their game. And if they're not, they'll answer for it. Okay. So I think it's good in both directions. Do you follow me? All right, we'll get some questions. Let me, let me kind of get through some more of the text. Um, now, he goes on to say, don't admit a charge against an elder or a priest, uh, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. Pay attention. The church is supposed to be self-correcting, and we've done a very poor job of that lately, right? So don't easily accept charges against a priest. If you're a bishop, he's talking to a bishop now, but by gosh, if two or three witnesses come forward, bring him up and get him, get his word on this. And if he's in trouble, rebuke him, get him to straighten up and fly right. Um, otherwise, out with them. And we haven't been too good about that. Okay. How many lay people have told me, I went to the bishop three or four times and he wouldn't answer me. How many people have had to tell me that uh, we sent letters and we got nothing in response from the bishop or we got mealy mouth responses um, how many times did, 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 did bishops not take seriously the concerns? And it might not have been the most serious charges we've heard about sexual abuse cases, but even lesser things like liturgical abuse or abuse of, where a priest is abusive of women. I mean, not a sexually abusive, but I mean, just, you know, chauvinistic or, or where he's racially insensitive or any number of things that a priest could do. And, you know, the bishop doesn't say or do much, you know, we have lost a sense where we have learned, we the clergy have learned to discipline. Even for me as a priest to pick up the phone, I'm a dean. And every now and again, I have to hear something about a brother priest and I have to go to that priest and say, what's this I hear about you, Father? Um, I had to go, I won't get too specific, but when I was a dean some years ago, uh, this is about 15 years ago, there was a priest who was misbehaving and I went to him and I said, now he was doing stuff on the internet, publishing stuff that was really bad. And I had to say to him, Father, you, you either take that down in right now before I hang up the phone with you, or I will report this to the bishop. You cannot go on. And he was, he was expressing a lot of inappropriate things for a priest to be saying, um, writing some novel-like material that was very inappropriate. And I said, you either take it down or I'm going to the bishop. And he took it down and then he put it back up and I went to the bishop. So again, I think the... Um, the point is there's too little of this. I'm not trying to ring my bell and say, because I don't always get this right. I don't always discipline as much as I should where I need to. I don't want a perfect parish. Um, and again, you, most of you who are parents or have been parents, uh, you know, you weren't perfect parents. You didn't always lay down and correct when you should have. And, but we ought to, at least as a consistent norm, be aiming for this, where the church should be self-correcting. And there's too little of this today. And not just at the level of clergy, but even parents toward their children. There's not enough of this today. And um, we've sort of lost our nerve. The authority crisis we're in, remember the 60s was anti-authority, but there's two sides to the anti-authority question because those crazy college kids grew up and they, they gained authority. But then all of a sudden they say, well, I don't want to use my authority. I want to be my child's friend. Oh. Your child does, your child has friends. Your child needs a parent. Be a parent. You know, but again, this authority thing, many people, it's not just that people don't like authority, but that those who have authority seem reticent to use it when necessary. You don't rush to 
punish or correct, but when you need to, by God, you got to do it. There's too little of this, okay? So uh, he's saying here, uh, you know, he's saying here, you, you need to do, uh, you need to re rebuke, uh, rebuke this, uh, an erring priest so that the rest may stand in fear. See what happens if I get out of line? See, okay. In the presence of God, and uh, well, go ahead, uh, verse, Craig, why don't, you, why don't you pick up from verse 21 and read to the end of the chapter. Oh, unmute, Craig. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hang on. Let me see if I can unmute you. Okay. Well, maybe someone else if you can't. I can't seem to be able to unmute you. Okay, there you are. Okay. So read from, uh, from verse 21 to the end. Okay. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus... And of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without favor, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor participate in another man's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some men are conspicuous, pointing to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good deeds are conspicuous, and even when they are not, they cannot remain hidden. Don't you love the way um, Paul sometimes interjects a thought there that has nothing to do with anything else? Hey, take a little wine uh, with your... <laughs> it's just a diversion. We'll look at that in a minute. But follow this. It says here, for in the presence of God and the angels, I, stand, I, I charge you to keep these rules without uh, prejudice, uh, prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. So be even-handed with your priest, okay? Uh, but be, uh, do not be hasty in laying hands. That's the ordination right again, right? So these, these presbyters aren't just older people. These presbyters are people who hold an office, who have a ruling or an authority role, and have hands laid on them, okay? So uh, we see that uh, don't be hasty in laying hands on a man. Now, therefore, again, in, technically, we have a very rigorous process in, in seminary formation which I think is much better today than it was, say, 40, 50 years ago. Um, we have a lot of psychological background testing. We have a, a, a very vigorous, uh, Benjamin, for example, who you're, you're seven years postgraduate. Now, that's even post-postgraduate. You had a medical degree. And on top of that, they're asking you to do two years of philosophy and four years of theology. And they got their eye on you. And they're looking for more character. They're looking for uh, piety for a sense of orthodoxy, all these things. So that there's a vigorous program in place today to very carefully vet the men uh, who we, before we ordain them. So the church is looking at them and they're looking at the church. And uh, we do have some men who enter the seminary who end up leaving, you know, whether the church asks them to leave or they leave on their own. Uh, so they don't all make it through the process. And the point being though, is that we've had to do more and more of this uh, because, you know, we, we've, we've seen how we've let some slip through who have caused great harm, okay? Now, of course, he also points out here that you can't see everything at once. And so we'll see how he, he qualifies that in a minute. But to the very best of your ability, Timothy, never lay hands on a man and make him a priest in a hasty manner. Find out a little bit about him, all right? Um, uh, now, do not take part in the sins of others, but keep yourself pure. Now, it's a little vague what he means here, but contextually, what it basically means is if you were to hastily lay hands on somebody, you might do that because he was a man of prominence or he was a son of a prominent family um, and he's full of sin and he's not, very, he's not very pious and you're sort of taking part in the sins of others by laying hands on him, um, more out of partiality and so on. But again, once you lay hands on a man, you're responsible for him, see? And if, you, if he's got a background full of sin, he's, what's the best predictor of the future? The past. Not that people can't change or turn over a new leaf, but on a general basis, if a man has lived a life of profligacy and confusion, and he doesn't just change on a dime, you know? He may have a conversion, but watch him for a few years. Make sure that conversion is good and stable before you lay hands on him, okay? Like Augustine, for example, all right? All right, now, um, finally it says here, well, but this idea, we'll, we'll return to the idea of water and wine in a minute. 
but notice verse 24. The sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear only later. In other words, some people have sinful habits that are open and obvious. They're drunk all the time, or they're sexually promiscuous, or immodest, or they're, uh, you know, but other people have more hidden sins, uh, things that aren't as clear or as obvious. It may come out later or may develop in their life later. The book of Sirach says, call no one blessed before his, he dies, for it is by an, his end that a man is known. I think we've all known people who lived a very pious life and then, I don't know, they something went wrong. Maybe they met the wrong person. They did something, you know, next thing you know, they're off doing something stupid in their old age. How did that happen? Usually because they met somebody. It's usually a romantic thing. You know, we do the dumbest things sometimes for romantic stuff. You know, suddenly this guy's been living a straight laced life and all of a sudden he's off riding, uh, uh, you know, smoking dope and hanging out with, I don't know, you know, I just, what happened to the guy? He was so, other times we find people who live very sinful lives, um, and yet have a great conversion. So we have to be, be careful to reserve our judgment. At this point in their life, this person seems to be living a good and an orderly life. But as my father often reminded me, people disappoint. And uh, sometimes people fall in with the wrong crowd. Bad company corrupts good morals. Uh, sometimes there's latent traumas or things that go on in their life that that sort of explode in later life. Maybe somebody's a maintenance drinker all their life and all of a sudden at age 65, they just go over the top and become completely lost in alcoholism. I mean, I'm not, turning, I'm not saying that's merely a sin. It could be an addiction, but you see the idea. People can have things go off the rails in their life, even later in life. So the point that Timothy is making is that, um, so be careful on who you lay your hands, do your best to judge. Um, uh, you know, their character, that they're tested, and so on, but also realize that sometimes the sins of some people appear obvious. Other sins are more subtle. Sometimes a man's pride is less obvious when he's younger. As he gets older, he becomes stubborn and prideful, and he says and does things that are harmful and hurtful. He will not be taught. He starts to shake his fist at God and the teachings of the church, and he gets old and nasty. Uh, other people become more humble and, uh, you know, holy as they get older. So, we, we have to see that we're all a bit of a mixed bag and we have to kind of kind of uh, realize that um, life's a funny proposition. And so do the best you can. Be careful who you lay hands on and realize too that um, there are people who go through stages in their life and they're not always pretty stages. Okay, Craig, I think I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, just a quick question. How much control actually does a bishop have over a priest under his jurisdiction? <laughs> okay, you have asked a very loaded question. Um, there, let me, are you familiar with the distinction between de jure and de facto? De jure means according to law, and de facto means just what it really is. <laughs> I'm a lawyer, I should know that. Yeah, so in other words, uh, a, a, a bishop can have has some limits, especially if a man's an installed pastor. He has certain limits. He can't just remove a pastor pastor has a right to stability, and he can say, I won't go. Now, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say most priests do say that or should say that, but there might be reasons that he feels like this is a wrong time to move, and the bishop has it in for me or this parish or has some other agenda, and the bishop doesn't, you know, the bishop can't easily remove him. So that's that's de facto. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's de, uh, de jure. But de facto, the bishop can make life pretty miserable for a guy who doesn't follow what he wants. Uh, uh, so, for example, uh, a, a guy might break some liturgical rules, uh, and the bishop says, you know, you really, for example, he says mass facing east. Uh, he has a right to do that, but the bishop doesn't like it. And the, but, so the guy says, well, you can't make me stop uh, because I have a right to do this according to Roman, the Roman ritual. And the bishop says, all right, you're right. I don't have a right to uh, make you stop. However, I have a new assignment for you at the prison. <laughs> You're going to take care of the, you're, you will now become the chaplain of the day of the jail. I mean, you know, in other words, uh, so bishops have a lot of practical authority over their priest. Uh, there are, though, especially for pastors, there are um, uh, definite juridical limits to a bishop's power. Likewise, over lay people, you know, you have rights. No bishop can compel you, even in time of COVID virus, to receive in the hand. 
You have a right to receive on the tongue. And anyone who says to you or tries to force you, they're violating your rights, okay? Uh, on the other hand, you know, one might argue, well, we'd be safer this other way or whatever. But the point is that no one can compel you, you see, to... So there are rights that people have that bishops can't just simply usurp. There are limits. So I hope that answers your question. Um, but however, that doesn't mean that a bishop should not, again, continue to discipline his priest. So for example, let's say, uh, although a pastor has stability of office, a bishop can and must remove him if there are serious moral allegations or serious violations of the priestly office. So in other words, he has to have a grave reason to remove the priest. And the priest can appeal it to Rome, but as long as the bishop, and there's a, by the way, I sit on a tribunal of three with three other priests, and it's our job that when the bishop wants to remove a pastor, uh, but the pastor refuses to go, that we are impaneled to investigate the situation and to indicate whether the, the bishop has proper grounds to remove this pastor. So there are methodologies, there are juridical procedures to go through uh, that bishops sh can and should respect. So a bishop isn't just, you know, his hands are tied, he can't remove a pastor. There are ways he can do it, but he has to follow procedures. Does it have to be a violation of canon law? Well, yes, but it could also be a question of moral turpitude, serious moral pro you know, issues, and or very serious insubordination, you know, that, that really affects, uh, you know, what, what a bishop legitimately has a right to ask a priest to do, okay? So, all right. So that's about the best I can do. This, uh, this can't become a canon law course, but just, just to say that there are limits to a bishop's power, but there are, they are not, ab uh, but a, a priest, a pastor does not have absolute veto power over something that a bishop asked him to do. And he ought to, because he makes a promise of obedience, obey wherever he can, okay? All right, a final thought, just to return to um, this little line about, no longer drink water only, but just a little wine, but take a little wine for the sake of your stomach and due to your frequent ailments. Basically, this goes back to a time, you know, you and I take for granted that water is purified today. Um, even our tap water, even though people are like, ooh, actually tap water is very pure. Uh, in fact, it may be even purer than some of this bottled water we run around because they put a lot of, you know, chlorine and other chemicals to keep the bacteria levels down. We we're used to pure water, purified water today. That's a very new phenomenon. Uh, frankly, less than 100 years old in this country, on a wide basis anyway. And in many parts of the world today, pure water is hard to come by. So to simply drink water puts a lot of bacteria in your system. And the ancients didn't always understand bacteria and microbes and all this kind of stuff. But they knew that somehow drinking wine would cause the stomach and other ailments related to the gastro and, you know, the whole system to become less severe. The, you know, likely it's the alcohol content or the acidic content of the wine that helps to kind of keep the bacteria levels from, from going too high. So pure water, you know, we think, oh, just drink, drink water. But that wasn't really either good for them or possible. Now, does that mean they drank a lot of wine? Well, they certainly drank more than we do. Were they walking around all day all tanked up? I, I don't think so. Uh, they, they tended to cut their wine with water and dilute it, but simply drinking water wasn't generally a good idea for a person. That's what Paul's getting at there, okay? By the way, in mass, you know, we mix a little water with the wine. That goes back to that ancient tradition. That a lot of their wines, as it came from the Vintner, were much thicker and stronger, and so they would take that, uh, that wine and cut it with some water diluted a bit, and then they would drink that. Um, and um, uh, so that, that would be um, uh, just a quick tour of that. It's getting late, um, and it's almost 9 o'clock. So would there be any final questions, comments, rebuttals, or what have you on this chapter? Remember, we reviewed two major institutions in the ancient church that are still here today. The Order of Widows, which has now just become the order of religious life, religious sisters, uh, likewise the, the office of priest or presbyter, um, and some of the aspects of, of how to handle these things. Okay, Shirley? I had a, 
a thought about the um, chapter where we where it talked about the uh, widower, if she has family to take care of her, that they should do that first. And I know I've, you know, in gen different generations behind me, you know, at one time you would always have a feeling that you're, you know, you would be there for your mother and generations. But I've heard a lot of women uh, my age and younger that are like, to think that the kids be, that their kids would take care of them. It ain't, it, you know, you don't have that security because of the kids are not that responsible. Yeah. And that goes along with everything else that should be taught. But yeah. it, it, it's a different, um, you know, that's why we have so many assistant living facilities because the family, yeah. they're not taking care of the, the elderly. So yeah. I kind of, that kind that thought kind of entered my mind you know, when we're reading that. And it's complex, I think, sociologically, surely, because um, um, to some extent, the, the, the needs of elderly people are different than they were 50 to 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. Most people, you know, you, there wasn't much you could do for them at a certain point, except put them in a back room, take good care of them, and, you know, help them to die well. But now we have, like, knee replacements, physical therapy. We have all these lung treatments and things you can't do at home. So that there are things available, you know, to people in nursing settings that uh, sometimes means, um, or, you know, questions of when they become, uh, they can't, they're no longer ambulatory, they can't walk any longer, you know, that, that uh, having them at home isn't always the best setting. That might be one answer. But on the other hand, uh, you're right. I think um, with, with the advent of social security and 401ks and, you know, all these retirement plans, we no longer really rely on our children um, and our children sort of don't expect us to rely on them and they, they easily shirk their duty and we don't want to be too bothered and we send people away to die. Um, so I, I think the, the complex medical setting has part of the reason, but there is also this other, yeah, we've, we've lost a sense that we really owe them. Uh, care at home if possible. Now in my own family, my, my grandmother Nana lived to be 94 and both my father and my, uh, my aunt said she's not going to any nursing home as long as we can avoid it. And so if she stayed, she lived in our, my parents' home and, and my aunt's home uh, till, till only one month before she died. She fell and broke her hip and then she needed to have surgery and she never really recovered from that. She did die in a nursing home, but only because she was recovering from surgery and heading for physical therapy, but she never survived it. So anyway, but my point in saying all this is that um, you're right, it's very complicated and we have to recover, I think, a better sense of what we owe to our elders, our parents and grandparents. So anything else? All right. Well, gosh, we covered a lot of ground. Isn't it interesting though, how the early church isn't so different from us, I mean, these things were maybe there in more in seminal form. All the details hadn't all worked out like we have today. That makes sense. You know, the acorn doesn't look like the oak tree, but everything that the oak tree will become is somehow mystically present in that acorn. And what we're looking at here are those basic fundamental elements that would grow and develop into what we have today. So there's a continuity uh, that, that develops uh, that we see in the Catholic Church. Uh, the basic elements of the Catholic Church are all here noted right here in the earliest days of the church. There's bishops, priests, deacons, there's an order of widows that would become religious life. We see, uh, we see all kinds of, uh, you know, rules and regulations and how to, you know, you get the idea. So we'll leave it at that for tonight. Um, bless you for attending and I'll, I'll end with prayer and uh, let you all say farewell. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We bless you, Lord, and thank you for this beautiful picture this, uh, of an early church that's not so foreign to us. So thank you, Lord, for the church. We've kept so many of these things down through the ages, and um, the early church looks pretty Catholic to me, Lord. <laughs> and so I'm grateful for that, and uh, it helps me to know that uh, I'm in the church you founded, and um, I'm grateful. So keep us all faithful to the church. We have our problems, but we also have our blessings and graces. And Help us to be patient with each other, love one another, and uh, continue to build this 
church that you call your kingdom and your body. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks. All right, may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm unmuting you all, um, and uh, you can say bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Right. I'll see you next bye. week. Good night, everybody. Be safe. Yes, safe. yes. yes. <laughs> Hope to see everybody next week. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Stay blessed. Good night. Good night.